Shabbat Shalom, family. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome, welcome to another teaching, to another broadcast. And I'm so grateful for another day, another yom, and another opportunity uh, to come together to seek the Father, to hear from Him, and to receive from His hand. We're so grateful. Hallelujah. We're so grateful. Well, once again, welcome to all of you. And we're going to begin with prayer. Hallelujah. Ab Yahuwah, I just smile. I smile in your presence because every day and every opportunity to come before you itself is a gift. There are people in this world who don't know you. And just the thought of it makes me want to weep. There are those who don't know you, who don't know your beauty and your splendor, who have not yet received of your forgiveness. There are those whose minds are troubled and bothered and who are trapped in sin. They don't know you. They don't know your Torah. And Father, you have chosen a people for yourself to be an example in the world and to teach those who are lost and trapped, to teach them all about the Savior that you sent for our nation first and also for the world. Father, may we arise. May we rise to the occasion and may we all be all hands on deck, all of us, young and old, male and female. May we all arise and be used of you, be poured upon by your Ruach and go into the world and teach and preach and prophesy and heal and raise the dead and do as Yahusha, who is our master, as he did. Father, may you exclude none of your people that you have chosen for yourself those who are obedient and humble before you. May you exclude none of them from your outpouring. I thank you, Father, for choosing us and for once again giving us an opportunity to be redeemed in your sight. I pray that you would lead this teaching today. I pray that you would be present with us, that your Ruach would enliven us and heal us and encourage us and guide us and direct us. We love you. You are the reason we breathe. Halal Yahuwah, all honor esteem to our King Yahusha, who loved us so much that he washed us from our sins in his own blood. We love him and we love you, Father. Please be present. Please be honored. And please receive this word and allow it to penetrate our hearts in the way you intend, Father. Receive me as your as your willing and humble servant, speak, dear Father. Please speak. In Yahushua's name I pray. Aman and Aman. Okay, family, once again, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. So we're going to get started with the lesson for today. And um, I pray that it's a baraka to you as we discuss these things. So let's continue on. We're going to be talking um, today about the Alaf Tau. And I have subtitled this, The DNA Signature of Yahuwah. And uh, this is um, quite an astounding uh, revelation that the Father has granted to us. For those of you who may not be aware, probably, let's say, I think two new moons ago, three new moons ago, the Father instructed me, he said, research the Alaf Tau. Now, I had heard of it, but I didn't know much about it. And so when he gave me those instructions on the new moon, I set off to research the Alaf Tau. And he took what I was able to, to gain just from looking at the letters and, you know, uh-huh. other people, you know, their insights on it. And then he added to it and just kind of blew my mind a little bit as I was looking these things out, you know, looking into these things. And so we're going to be talking and sharing about the Alaf Tau, the DNA signature of Yahuwah. So we're going to be anchoring this part of our discussion with the scripture to Halim 40, verse 7. And this is the Berean Standard um, Bible version. Then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll or the book or the Safar. I delight to do your will, O my Allahim, your Torah, your law, is within my heart. 
Hallelujah. Now this is uh, Dawood saying these words, but I believe it's someone else speaking through Dawood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. And we know that Yahushua said that the scriptures speak of him and that Masha wrote of him. And so we're going to see just a few of those instances where Masha wrote of him in ways that we before didn't know, didn't recognize. So where, the question is, where is it written of him in the scroll? And when he said, Masha wrote of me, and I thought, you know, reading this years and years ago, I thought, where did Moses really write about Messiah? Because we know this is one of those references to Messiah in the Davidic writings. And so I was just like, I guess I should say Daudic, Daudic writings. So I was like, where did he write about him? And he did allude to that prophet, you know, but there wasn't a whole lot. But there was more than we think when we look at it in the original language. And that's why it's so important that the Father is returning us to the original language because we can see things in the text that English will not show us. When we look into the Hebrew, we can see that there are additions to the Hebrew that is not translated in English. And so when you look in your King James or your scriptures that you've been using for a long time, you're not going to find the references that I'm re talking about in the text. Even for those of you who may have Hallelujah scriptures or who may have a Bible called The Scriptures and other things, you're really not going to find them. You'll find them, at least some of them, in the Sefer or the Safar scriptures. Some of them are in there. And some of them mistakenly try to translate these references to other words. But these references are to something greater than just, you know, the whatever the words that they decide to try to translate these words to. They represent the very DNA of the scriptures and the very DNA of the Father and his signature being shown to us in the text so that we can gain a greater understanding of him and of our Messiah. So DNA, such as it is, is like letters, okay? When you look at a strand of DNA, you can see it's a double helix wrapped in a, in a, in a spiral shape, okay? And there are four amino acids associated with DNA, and they are associated with letters. A, which is adenine, and, and T is thionine, and C is cytosine, and G is um, guanine. Uh, so we see these letters arranged in patterns, and when you arrange them in patterns, it creates a structure. So the whole of our genetic makeup, what makes our, um, our eyes the color they are, what makes our fingers long or short, or what makes us um, bow-legged or whatever it is, it's all contained within the DNA. It's all contained within the genetic structure comprised of these letters organized, okay? So, so too is the Hebrew text. The Hebrew text is such that it tends toward life because there is the DNA of the Father in the text. And that is why the language is so important. And when you divorce the people from their language, then you divorce them really from a, a sense, in a sense, the source of their life. So once one of the things that the Father did when he scattered us and wanted to punish us for the things that he had done is not only did he remove us from the paraka of the land, but he also divorced us from the language and the heritage that surrounds the language. And we did not realize just what a punishment that was until now. So we're going to look at a few Hebrew letters on the screen here. We have these letters. These are written in the modern or what they call the post-Babylonian exile um, Hebrew script, okay, or what we would see today is more like a modern Hebrew, okay? What, you know, the Ish people typically use. And so you see 22 letters, and these are the symbols that represent the letters, okay? You see Alaf is the first letter, and then you see Tau is the last letter, 22 letters. And then they have here some alternate, alternate shapes for letters when they fall at the end of a word. So, for example, the noon, you can see that the noon kind of looks like a like a backward L. And then when it's at the end of a word, it looks more like a like a seven, you know, 
So they look a little different when you find them at the end of the word in modern Hebrew. Okay. Continuing. And here you see an example of the Paleo Hebrew. And so Paleo Hebrew, such as it is, has gone through phases. And you see um, two of the phases of Paleo Hebrew and the modern Hebrew here on the screen. So you have what they call the Sinitic or the Paleo Hebrew that was used during the days of our ancestors' time coming out of Egypt, which they believe was based on the Egyptian hieroglyphs. So you see the Alaf here looking like a, actually looking like the horns of an ox, which is what it is. You see the second level column there is representing the Phoenician script, okay? And it looks similar to the original um, Sinaitic script. And so what you, when you see Paleo, Paleo Hebrew, you may see it written either in the first column or you may see it written in the, like in the second column. And I know sometimes it can be confusing. So you have to kind of go back to the original. And I, I actually prefer the original. I do. That's, I just prefer it because to me, it looks more like what it's supposed to represent. For example, bet, okay, or buy it. That kind of looks like a tent to me. It looks like a family compound, really. And then in the Phoenician script, it kind of looks like a man's head to me. But I could see how it could be like a tent kind of tilted on its side, right? But it's supposed to represent a house, a family, okay? The house of Yasharal is represented by this tent, the Bayat. And you can see in the Phoenician script how it's, um, I guess, that little comma at the end would be the way in which it has been anchored to the ground okay and what do you use to anchor your tent to the ground you use a tent peg and that here you'll see the sixth letter which they call a vav but it's really an ua and it is a tent peg so you would use a tent peg to anchor your tent into the ground to make sure that it didn't blow away okay so we could go into more of these but we won't that's not the purpose of this lesson today to go into all of the letters but here's an idea of what the letters are in the paleo hebrew so here once again is some examples of the, the proto um, sinaitic uh, text which as i stated may have been inspired by the egyptian hieroglyphs and i can see that so for example when we look at waters mem you can see it actually looks like waters or mayim is waters. So you can see it actually kind of looks like waves of water. And for example, noon. Noon is the seed, a seed of a man. You know, it kind of looks like that, doesn't it? Kind of looks like the seed of a man. It also kind of looks like a seed once it's been implanted in the ground and it starts to sprout. You can see that. And then the ein is the letter A and it looks like an I. And so I really appreciate the Sinaitic text because it actually really looks like everything that it represents. The kaf looks like the palm of a hand. That's exactly what it looks like. And the resh looks like a resh. And the tau, they have looking like a cross. It's not really a cross, but it's a mark. But we're going to talk more about that in just a bit. But I wanted to let you see some of the text if you haven't been familiar with the Paleo Hebrew. It's really fascinating once you begin to learn the Paleo Hebrew and see how certain letters are not only representative of letters, but they're representative of paragraphs worth of information. So when you read the text in the original Paleo Hebrew, it just comes alive because it's not just this symbol means this letter. It's this symbol means this understanding, this broad understanding. Okay. So we see here the first letter of the alaf tau is the alaf and the modern hebrew you'll see it rendered aleph uh, but this letter is associated with a and not e and there is no e in the paleo hebrew so it is alaf okay and i have here for our purposes i have it in the in the phoenician script and then i have it in the modern hebrew and i'm still trying to see how I really am trying really hard to see how that looks like an ox horns or like an ox in the modern Hebrew. I'm like, what did they do to that letter? <laughs> I, I'm trying. It's just, it escapes me. So I don't know how it ended up like that, but um, 
This is supposed to be the Aleph in the modern Hebrew, and it's representative of an ox and its horns, okay? And all that that represents. So if you turn the letter kind of upside down, you can see how those two um, projections kind of look like a horn, and that horizontal line could represent maybe like a, a harness around the, or the reins around the oxen. I just wanted to show you that perhaps. But um, this is what it represents. So the original pictograph for the Alaf is a picture of an ox head representing strength and power from the work performed by the animal. This pictograph also represents a chief, strength, or some other leader. When two oxen are yoked together for pulling a wagon or plow, one who is the older and more experienced one leads the other. Within the clan, tribe, or family, the chief or father is seen as the elder who is yoked together to, excuse me, who is yoked to others as the leader and the teacher. So the, the husband or the leader of the family would be the Allah of his bayet. Oh, this is so beautiful when you put the words together. He has a tent. He is the leader. He is the ox, the leader, the head, the chief of his tent or his family. Okay. So let's continue. The modern name for this letter is the Aleph and corresponds to the Greek a name Alpha. So when you hear I am the Alpha in the book of Revelation, that really in Hebrew would read I am the Aleph. And the Arabic name Aleph. The various meanings of this root are oxen, yoke, and learn. Each of these meanings is related to the meanings of the pictograph. And the Aleph is ox, strength and leader its presence converts the word into the first person it is the chief the power the oak tree the ram the pillar it also has an apostolic sense to it and it um, is an indication of manifestation okay all of this represented in one little pictograph and you can see when you take this pictograph and you apply it to the text the text just opens up there's just so much more there than we ever knew by taking these letters and translating them to one word, one letter, I should say, in English. So here's an example of the letter Allah in action. The Hebrew verb haya, haya, it means life, being, okay, life. For example, Eve's name is based on the Hebrew letter, Hebrew verb haya. Her name is hua, okay, she who is the mother of living, of all living, okay. Hua, which is based on Haya, okay? So when the father says his name is Ahaya, he has taken the Alaf and added it to Haya, and he is saying, I am, I be, I am life. So when you call him Ahaya, you are saying, I am, right? That is not how we speak. We don't go around calling somebody I am. If he says I am, our response is to say, you are, or he is. So Ahaya means I am, I be, I am life. Yahuwah means he is life. He is being, he is existence. Okay. So the verb has been properly conjugated in the form of Yahuwah and not Ahaya. Some people call him Ahaya and that's their business. That's between them and the most high. But he told us to call him Yahuwah. Okay. The conjugated form of this verb Haya. Continuing on. Okay, so more information on the Aleph. As the first letter of the Alaf Bet or the Alaf uh, Ba'et, the Al Alaf became the symbol for the number one. So the, the number associated with Hebrew letters, all Hebrew letters have a number associated with them. The number associated with the Alaf is the number one. And with the diuresis, the number 1,000. So if you have a, a diuresis on it, it represents the number 1,000. It is also the symbol for the Greek manuscript in the Codex um, Sinaiticus. The initial letter of the alphabet, and as the letter having derived from the pictogram for an ox, the letter itself sometimes connotes first, oneness, unity, uniqueness, or strength. So we'll just continue on to Tau now. I think we have a good sense of Allah. So now we're going to talk about Tau. This is the Hebrew pictograph on the right for Tau, and then the modern Hebrew for Tau 
on the left. Once again, I don't know how we got from what's on the right to what's on the left. That seems like quite a journey, but be that as it may, this is what it is. So when you see the Hebrew in its modern form, when you see a letter that looks kind of like an N with a little, a little J on the end, that is the letter Tau. Associated with the letter T, as Alaf is associated with the letter A. The ancient picture or pictograph for the letter Tau is a type of a mark, probably two sticks crossed together. So you can see that. You can see people using things in nature to represent things. And this is what we see in the Paleo-Hebrew. So two sticks crossed to mark a place, similar to the Egyptian hieroglyph, a picture of two crossed sticks. This letter has the meaning of mark, sign, language, monument, and signature, as in name. Okay? When you sign you are signing often your name to something. So that's important a reference right there to signature. The modern Hebrew, Arabic, and Greek names for this letter is Tav, T-A-V. So when you see it out in the world out there, you'll see it written as T-A-V. There is no V in the Paleo-Hebrew. That V should be a U. I have a whole teaching on this if you know, you're not aware of the fact that there's no V in the Paleo-Hebrew. A Hebrew word meaning mark. Hebrew, Greek, and Arabic agree that the sound for this letter is the, the sound, it's the t, the t sound, t. Okay? Continuing. So here we have a little bit more information on it, and it says, in post-biblical times, tav, or tau, came to stand for the number 400. So when you see tau, in the scriptures, it not only stands for whatever it means, mark, monument, sign, name, things of that nature. It also stands for the number 400, okay? As employing the letter that once signified a mark, some Tav words still in allude to marking, whether a person or a landscape, to having boundaries or the lack of boundaries, okay? So we're going to continue on. It's talking about Messiah here, but we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. So let's continue on. Okay. So the Allah Tau is the firstborn, first spoken of all creation. Okay. So if you imagine the father alone by himself before anybody else came into existence, before anyone else, the father is the only one who is from everlasting to everlasting. He existed alone. He is a chad. He is alone, single. Before anyone else came to being, he was happy and content within himself because he needs nothing, okay? He needs nothing in order to be whole. So from the state of wholeness or oneness, he spoke, or maybe he thought. Maybe he, he spoke or he thought. He could do it however he wants. He is ruach, okay? So the Aleph Tau is the firstborn, first spoken of all things that the Father did to our conscious awareness, okay? There could have been more that we're just not aware of. So the Aleph Tau is the leader, the mark, the sign, the signature of Yahuwah. He is the covenant and the strength of the covenant, and Yahuwah's words and promises are etched in the stone. They are etched in the rock of the son of Yahuwah, who is the son of Yah and the son of man. Messiah, who is the inheritor of all things, is the Aleph Tau. And we're going to talk about how he is the Aleph Tau, but that's not the only meaning of the Aleph Tau. And we're going to speak more about that as we continue on. So the father created and formed the world's beings, animals, plant life, using the word Hadabar. Okay? words. We create. I'm creating right now for you. And as I'm speaking, you're imagining what I'm saying. You may even have images in your mind as I'm speaking. I could be talking about trees and bloom. I could be talking about apples and oranges. And when I say those things, it creates word pictures for you in your mind. Okay. I am creating using words. That is how the father creates. He creates using words. He is Ruach. He can speak the words or he can think the words, okay? 
He is the place of Yahuwah as Yahuwah dwells in him by his Ruach. So the father dwells in the son by his Ruach. And when the father dwells in the son, the father thinks a thought toward the son and the son speaks the word. So he becomes the word of the father spoken aloud. In the heavenly realms, this has been the experience of people who have had encounters with Malachim. They don't need words, right? They think thoughts. The father said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith Yahuwah. The father doesn't need to vocalize. He can, but he doesn't need to because he has superior ability to think a thought toward you. And then you receive that thought, right? And you don't ever need to open your mouth. So he thinks thoughts toward us. When he thinks those thoughts toward us, we hear them through the Alaf Tau, the words written, both in the text and through his son. Hallelujah. The Alaf Tau is the A to Z. It is the equivalent of the English A to Z. Okay. And all words are comprised of letters. And so Yahusha is the, da, the Dabarim, the letters, the logos. He is the logos. The apostle Yachanan said, in the beginning was the logos, the Dabar, the word, the Alaf Tau. That's really what he meant. And if he had written this text in Hebrew, which he could have, if he had written in Hebrew, he would have said, in the beginning was the Alaf Tau. Okay? Hallelujah. Let's continue on. Imagine the father taking salient aspects of his character, his mercy, his forgiving power, his strength, his might, his compassion, and carving it on stone, right? Just as he carved the commandments for Masha, okay? So imagine him carving these in stone and saying, this is an image of who I am. This represents me. My name is in him, okay? This is the idea of the power of the language that the Father has given to us, okay? Yahusha is the representation of the language that the Father speaks to us through him. The Father thinks thoughts toward us. We hear them through the mouth of Yahusha. They're a team, now, does the father, did the father ever need to have his son in order to communicate with humanity? I don't believe so, because he is Yahuwah. There's nothing impossible for him, but this is the method that he has chosen, okay? So time and time again, we've seen in the scripture where you have the word, it says, the debar of Yahuwah appeared unto me, or the debar, the word of Yahuwah came unto me, saying, okay? Now, some of you by now should be thinking back to previous lessons that I've taught over the past two months, and now you're seeing how those lessons are really tying into this one and how those lessons needed to come forth so that we can have a proper understanding of what we're learning now, okay? The Debar of Yahuwah is Yahusha, the word, the spoken word, so that we can hear it, okay? All right, let's continue on. So Yahusha is that prophet that Masha prophesied about. He said that the father was going to send us a prophet and Yahusha is that prophet. And what is a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks the words of another. Yahusha is that prophet because he speaks the words of the father to us. And I'm going to say this, and some of you may agree or disagree. Even when, for example, Masha is speaking, Moses or some other prophet is prophesying in the scriptures. It's really the father speaking through his son to that person. When you give a word of prophecy, it's the father through his son to that person. So then you become a prophet of the prophet. And that is why the testimony of Yahusha is the Ruach of prophecy, because he speaks the words of the father through his servants. Just as he speak the, speaks the Father's words, we speak the Father's words through Yahusha. Hallelujah. He speaks the words of the Father. So in Yachanan chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, we read, For I, Yahusha, did not speak of my own, 
But the Father, Yahuwah, who sent me, commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I, Yahusha, know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I, Yahusha, says is just what the Father, Yahuwah, has told me to say. So if the Father thinks a thought toward him, and it comes out of Yahusha's mouth. And then Yahusha, who dwells in us by his Ruach, the anointing that was on him, which is now on us, the Father thinks a thought toward his Son, the Ruach within, then communicates it, to his son through us. So we become the mouthpieces of the father through his son, whose Ruach dwells within us. And his Ruach is the, the anointing of the father that was on him that's now in us. Hallelujah. Okay, so I found this image and it's not a very good one and it's got watermarks on it, but I wanted to kind of just give an image of what I'm seeing here regarding this and I'm, we're going to talk about this in a second but this scripture reads the father is greater than i so if you imagine that little block down there is being yahusha he said the father is greater than i so ask yourself if yahusha is the alaf tau what about the father he said the father is greater than i so let's talk about these things in revelation Chapter 1, verse 8, we read, I am the Alpha, the Omega. That should read in Hebrew, I am the Alaf and the Tau, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So I have a question for you. Who is this referring to? Is this referring to Yahusha or is this referring to the Father? Who's speaking in Revelation 1, 8? I'm going to go to the to the chat. Who's speaking? Hallelujah. Okay, Abba. So, uh, the Father, Abba. Okay, the Father. Yes, Abi, the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Father. Okay, I see lots of fathers. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so here's another question. Whose mouth are these words coming through? Whose mouth? Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. So you see a perfect example of what Yahushua was telling us. Yahushua's like, I speak the Father's words. He speaks his own words too, because he is our leader and he has to give us instructions. But everything he says comes through the filter of his Father. He wouldn't give any instructions unless the Father had pre-approved it first, because he is in complete submission to the Father. Hallelujah. Okay, so if the Father says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the Alaf Tau. Does that mean that the Father is the Alaf Tau too? Let's talk about that. So continuing with the notes that I have, and what I did was I just took the notes that I had written in my journal as I was studying this out, and I just transcribed them to the slide. So these are just my thoughts that the Father was kind of giving me indications about through his son, um, as you see written on the screen here. Yahusha is the created, formed Alaf Tau, okay? See Proverbs chapter 8, where Yahusha talks about him being brought forth, okay? Yahusha did not always have existence. The Father has always existed. Yahusha, who has eternal life, has not always existed. He has a beginning, okay? That is the Alaf portion of who he is. The Alaf is reference to beginning. That's another meaning. Beginning. The Allah, the beginning, the first. Okay. Yahuwah is the eternal Allah Tau. Yahusha is the brought forth Allah Tau, but Yahuwah is the eternal Allah Tau, meaning he is the beginning because he begins other things. I'm going to say that again. Yahusha is the beginning because he was brought forth first out of all creation. The Father is the beginning because he begins everything. We are all here. We all exist. We all have a beginning because Yahuwah is the one who begins the beginning. Hallelujah. Okay. So he created all things through his son, but he also created and brought forth his son first. Okay. He brought him forth first. He is the Tao, the father, is the Tao, because he will exist long after everything has ceased to be. 
If the father withdrew his Ruach, everything would cease to be, but he would continue on. So he is the beginning because he begins beginnings and he is the ending because he will exist after everything else is gone. So Yahusha is the Alaf Tau made in the image of the Alaf Tau. Oh, hallelujah. So the father is the Alaf Tau and the son is the Alaf Tau. Hallelujah. Okay. Yahusha is the Alaf because he is the beginning of the creation of Yahuwah. He is the Tau because he is the ending of the creation of Yahuwah. And all things are bookended in him. The Father has made it so that everything in creation has to be in his Son. And if it's not in his Son, it will not exist. It will cease to be. So those things that have not been or will not allow themselves to be put under Yali rule, under the sun of the highest, it will find itself in the lake of fire, okay? Because Yahusha is the Alaf Tau, a chip off the block of the original Alaf Tau. Hallelujah. Yes, a mirror image. Now, you remember we talked about this, about Yahusha being the signet of the Father. He is the mirror image. He expresses the image and the person of the Father, but he could never express all that the Father is. But when you see him, you see the Father, because there's enough there to give you an idea of what the Father is like. His nature, his character, his power, his prowess, his might. It's enough to see him, right? Just as a father who has a newborn son, when he looks at that son, he could say, that is the son of my strength. That is the son of my right hand. But he is not me. He is of me, but he's not me. I am greater than my son. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's continue on. Yashayahu chapter 44. Thus saith Yahuwah, the king of Yasharal, and his redeemer, Yahuwah of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no Allahim. Okay, so these are the words of the Father here. And he is saying, I am the first and I am the last. He's saying, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no other Allahim. So this is how the Father is describing himself as the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Okay, and we see another verse of scripture in Yahshayahu chapter 41, where he says, Who has performed and done it? calling the generations from the beginning. I, Yahuwah, am the first. In this instance, he actually used the Allah. I am the Allah, and I am the Tao. I am the first and the last. I am he. So the Father is telling us, I am the Allah Tao. And we know that the Son is the Allah Tao. So the Allah Tao and the Son is a chip off the block of the original Allah Tao. Hallelujah. So I did a screenshot here just to let you see the words. So who performed it and done it? Calling the generations from the beginning. I am yeah, Yahweh, but it's Yahuwah, the first, the Rishon, and with the last, Ahab. It's really interesting how the last is similar to the name Aharun, Aharunim. Aharunim is the last in Paleo-Hebrew. So let's continue. And Chatsun. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. But he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Okay, now this is Yahusha speaking. Yahusha is telling uh, our ancestor Yachanan, Don't be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. Okay? And then in Chatsun, Revelation chapter 22, verses uh, 13, verse 13, he says, I am the Allah and the Tau, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. Okay. So the Father is the Allah Tau, the Son is the Allah Tau. Hallelujah. The Father is Alua and the Son is Allahim. And we're going to talk about that too. So, hallelujah. So, Yahusha is the book of life that we run into so that we can be saved. We run into him, the righteous run into him so that they can be saved. He is that book of life. The book of life is comprised of letters from Allah to Tao, from the beginning to the ending. And we run into that book of life so that we can be saved. 
and be spared. Yahusha is the Alaftal, the Book of Life, the book the Father is speaking. He is the spoken words of the Father. The Son is the image, the seal, the mark that imprints the image of the Father upon us. We talked about this in a previous lesson. It is unitary and unique. Yahusha lives in the bosom of the Father and is also unique, the only one of his, of his kind. And in the Greek, that word is monogenes, monogenes, the only one of his kind, unique, okay? Unique among the Malachim, among the other messengers. He is unique. He is the first one to be brought forth, and he has been given power and authority and a position and an inheritance that the other Malachim do not have. Okay, he is unique. He, the Alaf Tau, is the book of life and the book of the Father that the Father is writing. Okay, the Son is an image, a seal, a mark. Remember, the word Tau means mark. Yahusha is the Tau, the mark that imprints the image of the Father upon us. Without him, we can't know the Father like that. We can't have the Father imprinted upon us without the Son. It is unique and unitary, okay? Yahusha lives in the bosom of the Father and is also one of its kind. Yahusha, Yahusha is the signet, the signet, like the signet ring of the Father, his image, his nature, his authority, and we must all be written in him. Yahusha is the book of life. We must all be written in him, in Yahusha in order to inherit eternal life. If we have not, if our names have not been written in the book of life, Yahusha, then we can't have life, okay? The Alaf Tau is the author and the finisher of our Amunah, hallelujah. So we must be written in Yahuwah's book. Yahusha is that book. Okay, here's an example of a signet or a, a clay seal. So this was found in, um, well, they said it was found in East Jerusalem, but who knows where it was found. Its current location is in a museum in, in Jerusalem, and it's Paleo-Hebrew, and it's a clay surface, or it was wet clay that was embossed with a seal. And the transliteration is this. The first line says, Le Barak Yahu, the second line, um, Ban Nari Yahu, Third line, Hasafar, and it means belonging, or this belongs to Barak Yahu, which means bless Yahu, Yahuwah, the son of Nariah, or Nariahu, the scribe, okay, the scribe. So it says the clay bulas, such as this one, are made by placing a lump of wet clay on a document and then using a signet ring to impress the seal of the owner on the clay. It is possible that this seal belonged to Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe, okay? So, we are clay. Yahuwah is the potter, we are the clay. He wants to see himself represented in us, okay? We exist for his kabod, his glory. He wants to see himself represented in us, so he has to impress himself upon us so that we reflect his nature and his character. He does that through Yahusha. Yahusha is that signet ring that he impresses and embosses upon us so that we take on the likeness and character of the Father through the Son. But it can only happen if we are wet and malleable. If you are hard-hearted and stiff-necked, it will not take. Think about that. Think about taking a signet ring and trying to emboss it on hard rock or hard clay. It won't emboss. It won't work. And this was the problem with our ancestors. As the father was seeking to impress himself upon us so that we could be like him, he kept finding us being hard-hearted and stiff-necked and the image would not take. It wouldn't, okay? We have to be soft and malleable and good ground so that that seed of Yahusha can be planted in the gardens of our hearts and so it can bring forth and produce fruit. So Yahusha is like his father. 
He is like the Father. Though the Father has given us a name by which we are to address him, the name Yahuwah, Yahuwah's true name cannot be expressed in totality because it is vast, eternal, and endless. There is no name that we could give the Father that would represent all that he is. It just, it's impossible. It's impossible. Volumes upon volumes upon volumes, endless volumes of books would have to be comprised to describe the Father. It, it would be an eternal process of trying to describe him. Because the minute you think you understand, there's another aspect of him that you go, oh my gosh, there's more. Okay, he's eternal in his personhood. So the best we could do is he tells us to call him, I am being, I am life. He calls us, he tells us to call him, he is being, he is life. That's the best we could do. He is the great I am because he is being, he is life. But to say his name is um, Fred, you can't do that because Fred has a meaning. And once you apply that meaning, then that means Fred can't be anything else. But the father, you can't apply just one thing to him in terms of a meaning of his name. He is existence. He is being. That's about the best we can do. And then we come up with all of these attributes and all of these wonderful um, adjectives for him. And still, words feel, sometimes feels like words just aren't enough to describe to him all that he is. It's just, it's insufficient. So the best way, family, the best way for us to demonstrate our ahab, our love, our care, our concern for him is to keep his commandments. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And when we do, we show that we love him. Hallelujah. So continuing on, because Yahuwah's name can be expressed in a name, he's given us Yahuwah to call him, which means existence. Okay. So the book of life is comprised of letters, Hebrew letters. This is the Alaf Tau. Yahusha, who is made in the image of the Father, is also the Alaf Tau, the created or the brought forth Alaf Tau. The Father is the eternal Alaf Tau with no beginning and no ending. Hallelujah. So, for example, Yahusha, written on stone, as I stated before, written for us. He is the book of the Father, the Father expressing himself through Yahusha to us, okay? He is the written words, expression, image, personality, name of the Father. Remember the Father told the children of Yashara, I'm sending my angel to guide you out of Egypt. Pay mind to him, obey him, because he won't forgive your transgressions because my name is in him. What name is that? The Alaf Tau. My name is in him, okay? And this is an example of this being, a beingness, this I amness, for lack of a better, better phrase. This idea of I amness of the Father is in the Son. Hallelujah. And that's what makes him a life giver. He is able to give us life because the father gave him life and he gave him life to the degree that he could now share it. It's the difference between somebody coming onto Zoom as a participant and being given rights as a host. So someone who's been given rights to the host can do all these things behind the scenes to help, okay? Yahusha is the host of our lives. He's not just a participant. He, he's been given power by the father to work and to help us to become the image of the Father through Him. Okay? Hallelujah. Continuing on with our discussion of the Alaf Tau. The Alaf Tau symbol appears in every book of the Tanakh when the primary subject matter is most often to identify covenant peoples, persons, places, things, or titles pertaining to covenant relationship and control by Yahuwah, the, uh, the Father, with both and through Yahusha concerning all of his creation. All of that is saying, in every instance of the text, of the Tanakh, where there's a word that's being spoken that relates back to the Father, relates back to creation, relates back to Yahusha, in some way when the Father wants to indicate ownership over it or some link to himself, there's an Aleph Tau next to it. In the Hebrew text, you won't see that in the King James. You won't see that in any of the English translations. There are 
Allah Tao's symbols in regard to Yahuwah the Father's judgments, blood atonement, and covenants, which imply both Father and Son working together as one. Yet there are also dozens of chapters throughout the Tanakh where there are no Allah Tao symbols because the subject matter apparently does not merit their placement. And this is a quote from the Allah Tao Aleph Tav scriptures, page 28. Okay, so now we're going to talk about creation. We're going to see the Aleph Tau in creation. Okay, so this is an um, example taken from the Messianic Aleph Tau scriptures, uh, second edition. And so there it is on the screen. If you're interested, you can check it out, purchase a copy if you're interested. And you can see uh, an example on the screen of what it would look like. So here we are in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, created, it says Elohim, but we would say Allahim in the Paleo-Hebrew. Okay? The only thing that would make these scriptures better is if it was in the Paleo-Hebrew. Okay? So we're going to zoom in a little bit more. Okay. In the beginning, created Allahim, and then you see the Alaftal right there. So this Alaftal is either referring to Allahim, or it's referring to the heavens, okay? The heavens and the earth. It seems to me that it's referring to the heavens because there's another one here and the earth and included with this one is the Ua sign. And the Ua is a connecting point. Remember, it's the tent, the tent peg and the tent peg, it connects things together. So this, these two Aleph Tau's are being connected together. Heavens and earth are being connected together together by this Ua, or this what they call the Vav, okay? And the earth was, or became, chaos and void. And darkness was over the surfaces of the abyss. And the Ruach of Alua vibrated, moved, hovered over the surface of the waters. And Allahim said, let there cause there to be light. And there was light. And saw Allahim, the light, that it was good. And Allahim separated the light from out of the darkness. And Allahim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was, existed, evening and morning, day one. Okay? And Allahim said, Let there be a firmament or a dome in the midst of the water, and let it divide the water from the water, and made Allahim the firmament and divided the waters which were on the firmament from the waters above the firmament. Okay, so I'm wondering if you can see in the text a partnership here, and I've never seen it before until I learned about the Alaf Tau. After I learned about that, and I'm reading it with an understanding of the Alaf Tau, of the Father and the Son and their roles, I see completely different. This is, I see something completely different when I read this. So I'm going to go to the chat and see what do you see in this passage that we've just read? What do you see here that maybe you haven't seen before? Okay. 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 All right. <laughs> All right. Here it is. I wish I could put this on the screen. Okay. Anyway, she says, more collaboration and a merging of Abba and Yahuwah. Yahusha said it. Okay. Yes. Yahusha conducting the Father's work. Yes. That's what we see in the text. And you and you you don't really see it all that well without me being explained this way with the Alaf Tau in place. Okay. Yes. The Father is thinking a thought toward the Son, and the Son is doing the work, right? and speaking it into existence. So the father thinks the thought to Yahusha. He thinks, let's just go, let's, let's see. Let's find an example. Okay, verse six. And Allahim, oh, and by the way, when they're working together like this, they're called Allahim because it's Alua the father and Allahim the son. So they're working in concert with one another and they're called Allahim. Alua and Allahim together working. So Allahim said, let there be a firmament dome in the midst of the waters. Okay. Verse seven. And Allahim made the firmament. You see, now if you're looking at this thinking, 
why in the world are they describing it this way? Because there are two people here. There are two people at work here. There's the father in the form of the Ruach thinking thoughts toward his son. And then his son is then speaking the words into existence. Remember, he is the Dabar. So the father is thinking thoughts toward him, thinking thoughts of be firmament, make a firmament. And, the, and Yahushua says, firmament, be, come into existence. And then the words of the father spoken through the son's mouth comes into existence. So that's why the scripture says the father created the world. He did, but he did it through the word, through the debar, through Yahushua's mouth. So when the scripture says Yahushua is indicated in the creation, he is. He was a partner with the father in creation. Okay. In Genesis, about a sheath, chapter three, verse 24, he drove out the man. And what do we see there? The Allah Tau. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden or Adan, he placed the cherub and a flaming sword that turned everywhere to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. So here the Allah Tau's in the text are telling us a few things. There's one next to the man which is an indication that the man belongs to the father, okay? Even after the man sinned, there's still an Aleph Tau next to his name. And certain people in the scriptures, not every instance, but in certain instances in the scriptures, you will see an Aleph Tau next to people's name. Like there's an Aleph Tau next to uh, Masha's name. Or for example, there was even an Aleph Tau next to Esau's name in the text. But after Esau sold his birthright, when Masha was writing the text, he no longer placed an Aleph Tau next to Esau's name because actually Masha described it like is like this. He said Esau despised his birthright. He despised his Aleph Tau. And so he no longer included it next to his name. So the fact that this Aleph Tau is next to the man right here is an indication that the man still is in covenant relationship with the Most High Yahuwah and he still claims him as his own. And in the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherub, okay? So Eden, Adon, also has an Aleph Tau next to it, okay? And the cherubim with a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life. So you see next to cherubim and flaming sword, there's an Aleph Tau. This is a reference, I believe, to Yahusha, that Yahusha was the one who was tasked with responsibility of shooing us from the garden and creating the block to the tree of life so that we couldn't come and partake and then be perpetually and eternally in sin, okay? And that he is the one who guards the way to the tree of life, okay? He guards the way. He is the way and he guards the way, okay? All right. So I'm going to continue on. So now we're going to talk about the sign of the Son of Man. Okay, the sign. Remember the letter Tau, the Hebrew letter Tau means sign, signature, mark. Okay, the sign of the Son of Man. Luke chapter 21, verses 20, verses 24 through 28. And they will fall by the edge of the sword. This is talking about our ancestors, meaning they would lose the battle and lose the war against the Romans and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Hallelujah. This is such an encouraging word for, for the Father to bring to us through his Son knowing that we would read it in the middle of captivity and be encouraged by it, okay? So our ancestors were led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem has been trampled by the Gentiles, and the time of the Gentiles is almost just about up, okay? And when this time comes, we are told that we will see signs in the sun, 
and the moon and then the stars and that there would be a distress of nations. There would be perplexity. There would be wars and rumors of wars and all manner of things happening on the earth as a sign of the times, okay? And when we see these things, we're to know that our redemption draws near. So I want to talk about this eclipse because this eclipse is a sign, okay? This eclipse is no accident. It's a sign, okay? So we see it is scheduled for April 8th, uh, 2024. It's a total solar eclipse and it's worldwide. And you can see that there's not a part of the United States that doesn't have some uh, degree of viewing of this eclipse, okay? The area of totality is rather large. And then even those who are in the, the colors that um, bleed out from the main red line, they're going to have some semblance of, you know, being able to view this total eclipse, okay? So it passes, it comes up through Mexico, right? And then passes over the Midwest and then heads toward Europe, as you can see, okay? Here is um, an image on the screen of an eclipse that is happening on April 8th. And then the second one that's scheduled for, I believe, in October, another one that's going to be mainly in South America, okay? But you see the path of the April 8th um, eclipse as it heads, it cuts through the United States and then heads toward Europe, almost like a harbinger, like a harbinger of future events. And I believe it is. So let's continue on. This is the 2017 eclipse, and I was in the I was Baruch to be able to be in an area of totality. So I went out in my backyard. We had people come up from um, some friends come up from different places. Um, one from Florida and one from North Carolina came up. And they were like, "Oh, you're in totality. Can we come to your house and see the eclipse?" I was like, "Sure, come on." And so we all hung out in our backyard and we watched the eclipse. And at that time. I had no clue what these things meant. I had no clue. I was just as ignorant as I wanted to be. I was in my backyard. We watched it. We saw the totality. It got dark. We saw the whole thing. The people were like, oh, yeah, this is cool. This is great. And had no idea of the spiritual significance of these things. And they're spiritually significant. So this happened seven years ago. And you know the number seven is really significant with the Father. So this happened seven years ago. And then we have yet another total eclipse that's coming this year, next month, that cuts a similar pattern, but in a different way, okay? And when it cuts this pattern, it creates some letters, some Hebrew letters across the United States, okay? So this first line is the eclipse, the path of the eclipse from 2017, okay? You can see how it came through like Portland, Bend, Oregon, to be exact, and then came down through, interestingly, Charleston. And Charleston was a major area where, where um, slaves were brought through, the ports. I want to go back to a slide for a second because I wanted to, to note how if you look at these two eclipses, this one was February 26, um, 2017, and this one was in August of 2017. When you look at them, they look like they're going through the United States. But if you look at it in reverse, doesn't it look like it's a path out of Africa to the Americas? Doesn't it look like it could be the path of slave ships coming from Africa and bringing the Most High's children to the New World? It certainly looks that way to me. Because we know that number two eclipse went on into Africa, right? So it looks to me as if the Father is giving indication or a hint or a nod to the people who are holding his people captive. I know you've got my people. Look, I'm drawing lines in the sky. I know you've got my people. Okay? You gotta let my people go. So just a little, little nod there. We have the 2017 eclipse that went through the middle of the United States, or I should say the Midwest. And now we have the eclipse that's coming up in April that's going through, once again, the Midwest, coming up from the South, okay? The first one came up from the North, and this one's coming up from the South. 
and it creates a big X over the United States. This X looks very much to me like a Hebrew letter Tau. Okay? And it, it's a sign. The letter Tau literally means mark sign. Okay? It's a sign. It's a sign of something. The Father is speaking. Okay? I told you, you got my people. You got to let my people go. All right? So some people aren't listening. But in addition to that, we had another eclipse. It wasn't a total eclipse, but it was an annular eclipse. An annual eclipse that happened in October of last year, October 14th of last year. This annular eclipse came also from the north and headed toward the south. And when you put all of these together, you have not only the Tau, but you have now the Alaf. So you have the Alaf and the Tau over the United States. Now tell me this is not a sign. Okay, this did not happen by chance. It's not a coincidence. The father is speaking. Okay, so we have the Alaf Tau over the United States. And I've already said in this lesson so far that the Alaf Tau represents the father and his son. Okay, the first time the father sent the Malak to gather his children out of Egypt, I believe. He's going to do it again. Now, when the, the when the Malak came, he wasn't seen. Masha was seen, but the people didn't necessarily see the Malak. But they saw the signs. They saw the pillar of cloud. They saw, saw the pillar of fire. So they saw the signs that he was with them, but they didn't necessarily see them. And it may be that way again. Okay? This, is the, this could be, I'm not going to say it is, this could be the sign of the Son of Man, that he is very near. Okay? In addition to that, <laughs> there's a devil comet. <laughs> there's a devil comet headed our way. And it says, and that's okay. No, it ain't. <laughs> it's a harbinger. Comets are harbingers of judgment for sure, right? And the fact that they're calling this one a devil comet, oh my word. And it says, sure, it's big and it looks weird, but Comet Ponds Brooks is no danger and actually has sky watchers very excited. Okay, so we see it here. Uh, the reason they're calling it uh, Devil Comet because it kind of has what looks like two horns. It's very difficult to see, but they're saying it kind of has two horns. And so, but this is the comet Ponds Brooks. It said it underwent a second outburst in early October 2023, once again developing horns as captured here while it was in Draco. Now, <laughs> the Devil Comet was in Draco, the constellation. Draco means dragon. Hmm. Could there be something there, there? Anyway, the devil comet is passing through at the same time that we have this total eclipse coming. It could be significant. It could be a sign. So it says the last time the comet Pons Brooks passed perihelion, the closest point to the sun in its orbit was 1954. The next will be April 21st, 2024. That's just two weeks after the April 8th total solar eclipse that will cross North America. And we now know that the comet Pons Brooks will be in the sky near the sun during totality. It is likely to be bright enough to pick up with binoculars. And if it outbursts again, perhaps even visible to the naked eye in the daytime, daytime twilight brought on as the moon covers the sun. This is a special treat on top of an already exciting event and one you won't want to miss. Comets are not only beautiful, but they offer us the opportunity to study the building blocks of our solar system and the interaction between the sun and the objects that orbit it. So the next time you hear about the devil comet, you'll know better. It's really an exciting and benign visitor that will help make an already once in a lifetime eclipse more memorable. Okay, so that's an article about the devil comment. Is it significant? It could be. It could very well be. Okay? At the very least, it speaks to the fact that um, we know that the fallen are coming to the earth. And so the devil comment making its appearance during the time when the sun's going to be darkened certainly is uh, an indication of what's to come to the earth. Okay? So let's continue.
All right. I'm going to hit the comments real quick before I continue on. Oh, yeah. The, tra uh, the Chinese year of the dragon this year, too. That's right. Oh, my goodness. Everything is just falling into place, family. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking at this. It says the best cities to see the total eclipse of 2024. And as you can see, this eclipse runs, as I stated, through Mexico, coming up the United States, through Texas, and on into uh, Canada before heading to Europe. So if you look at some of the places that will experience totality, you'll see places like Fredericksburg, uh, San Antonio's there. You can't really see it on the map, but San Antonio, Austin, Waco, Texarkana, Little Rock, Carbondale, Illinois. Please make note of Carbondale. Keep that in your mind. Carbondale, okay? Bloomington, um, Cleveland. And I don't know what this means, but the, a couple of weeks ago, I, I woke from a sleep and I heard the word Cleveland. And I don't know why. I still don't know why. But I heard Cleveland. So it's interesting that Cleveland is one of the cities that will experience totality. Uh, we see also Erie, Pennsylvania, Dayton, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, Syracuse, New York, uh, Montpelier, Vermont, uh, Burlington, and so on and so forth, okay? So this is the line of the, the eclipse that's coming next month, okay? So let's continue. Here's another line. This is the line from 2017 of the eclipse, okay? And here's the 2024 line. You'll see that the crossing point or there's an intersection point. Where? At Carbondale. Hmm. There's an intersection point between these two eclipses at Carbondale, Illinois. Is that significant? I believe it is. So we're gonna look at these things a little bit deeper, a little bit closer. Okay, so I wanted to show you some of the places that will experience some level of a totality from this upcoming eclipse. And I'm going to show you the names of them. And let's look for something that seems significant. So right off the bat, this seems significant to me. Several of the cities are named Egypt. We have Egypt, Arkansas, Egypt, New York, Egypt, Vermont, Egypt Grove, Missouri, and Egypt Mills, Missouri. Okay. So we have cities named Egypt. Interesting, right? Just interesting, just to note. We also have an Africa, Ohio. We have several Zions. We have Zion, Arkansas, Kentucky, Missouri. We have Zion Hill, Zionville, and Zionville. Okay? So we have several Zions and an Africa. Okay? Just taking note of some of the city names. We also have an ensign, which means a sign. Ensign means sign. In Ensign, Texas, we have an Alpha, Ohio, and Alpha, Arkansas, and Omega, Illinois, and an Omega, Indiana. Interesting. Just taking note. We also have on the left column all of these references to freedom. Free Union, Freedom, 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 Freedom Station, Freehold, Freeland, Freeman, Freeman Hill, Freeman Spur, Freeman Township, Freeport, Freestone, Freetown, and Murfreesboro. Okay, all of these references to freedom here in these city names that this eclipse will pass through. Also, on the right side of the screen, we see all these references to Jerusalem or Salem. Jerusalem, um, Arkansas, New York, Vermont, New Jerusalem, Ohio, New Salem, Indiana, Kentucky, and Indiana. We see Salem, Illinois, Kentucky, um, and Maine, and Illinois. We see Salem and Arkansas. We see South Salem in Indiana. And then we see West Salem in Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. All of these references to Salem or Jerusalem and freedom and Africa and Egypt. Interesting. Let's continue. We also see some references to the Lamb. Lamb, Illinois, Lamberson, Lambert, Lambert in Maine, Missouri, New York, Texas. We also see wilderness in Wilderville in Missouri and Texas, okay? Just making some observations. Some of these city names. 
We also see in Indiana, Groomsville, and Missouri, McBride. So we have the McBride and the Groomsville. We have Oil Center, Oil Creek, Oil Grove, Oil Trough, Oil Field, and then we have Lampasas. So we have a groom, a bride, an oil, and a lamp. But I'm sure this is a coincidence, right? So then we have on the screen, a really wonderful rendition of the eclipses that we're discussing right now. We see the one from 2017, and we see the one from um, 2023 in October, and the one that's upcoming in just a couple of weeks or so, just a few weeks. So notice that there are some crossing points here where they cross over. We see a crossing point in Bend, Oregon, where the two eclipses cross, okay? We also see a crossing point in San Antonio, okay, where they cross there. And another crossing point right there where it's called Egypt. But where is that? You don't see it on the screen, but it's Carbondale. I told you to hold Carbondale in your mind. That location is Carbondale. Carbondale, Illinois, also called Little Egypt. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence, right? It's called Little Egypt. And south of Carbondale is a town called Cairo. But I'm sure that's just another coincidence too, right? Family of the Father is speaking. So I've been looking at these, these um, words on the screen for a while when I was preparing this study, and I was like, Father, this is significant in some way. And I'm not saying that this is significant, but I'll just tell you what I thought. These are my thoughts, the machinations of the mind of <laughs> Amaria, okay? We have the word bend, we have the word Egypt, and then we have the words San Antonio. Let's take out the word San for a second and just look at Antonio, okay? Bend, Tonio, Egypt. Now, when I see the word Antonio, I really hear the word knee. Bend, knee, Egypt. The father is going to bend the knee, Antonio, of Egypt. That's what I see, but maybe it's just me. Bend the Antonio of Egypt. Yes, he will. He will bend the knee of Egypt. He did it before, and he's going to do it again. Hallelujah. So continuing on, this area, as I said, is called Little Egypt. It's Southern Illinois. And as you see right there, south of Carbondale and that region is a town called Cairo. <laughs> and passing through this area is the Mississippi River that's kind of Nile-like. Yeah, America is Egypt. Okay, let's continue. So we're going to read a bit about Carbondale. Carbondale is a city in Jackson County, Illinois, in the southern Illinois region, informally known as Little Egypt. The city developed in 1853 because of the stimulation of railroad construction in that area, and so on and so forth. Okay, So I just wanted you to see that Carbondale is informally known as Little Egypt. That was the crossing point in the middle of the United States for both the 2017 eclipse and the upcoming eclipse, okay? Significant. Let's continue. Have you ever heard of something called the Knights of the Golden Circle? I hadn't until I started studying for this lesson. The Knights of the Golden Circle is a secret society founded in 1854 by George Bickley the objective of which was to create a new country known as the Golden Circle, where slavery would be legal forever. Yes, you heard me, right? Forever. They don't teach you this in your history books. The country would have been centered in Havana and would have consisted of all the southern United States and a golden circle of territories in Mexico, which was to be divided up into 25 new slave states, Central America, northern parts of South America, Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and most other islands in the Caribbean. 
Okay. So the brilliant idea of this guy, <laughs> Bickley, I should say wicked idea, was to end the slave question. Let's stop talking about whether or not a state should be a free state, a slave state. Let's just create our own world where slavery exists forever. And this is what they're endeavoring to do. They wanted to invade Cuba and make this happen. Okay. It says the KFC's proposal grew out of a previous unsuccessful proposal to annex Cuba. This was the Ostend Manifesto, parts of Central America and all of Mexico. In Cuba, the issue was complicated by the desire of many in the colony for independence from Spain. Mexico and Central America had no interest in being part of the United States. Originally, the KGC advocated that the new territories should be annexed by the United States in order to vastly increase the number of slave states and thus the power of slaveholding uh, Southern upper classes. As you can see on the left side of the, excuse me, on the right side of the screen, in the dark green is the proposed region for this new um, slave holding part of the United States, or maybe they wanted to be independent from the United States altogether. You'll see it includes essentially all of Mexico and part of uh, South America, all the Caribbean islands and all of the Southern states. Okay. This is what they're proposing. So that here in this region, slavery would be in existence in perpetuity. It goes on to say, in response to the increased anti-slavery agitation that followed the Dred Scott decision in 1857, the Knights changed their position. The Southern United States should secede, forming their own confederation, and then invade and annex the other areas of the Golden Circle. The proposed new country's northern border would roughly coincide with the Mason-Dixon line, and within it were included such cities as Washington, D.C., St. Louis, Mexico City, Panama City. In either case, the goal was to increase the power of the Southern slave holding upper class to such a degree that it could never be dislodged. Interesting. So this was their goal, this was their objective, to create perpetual slavery for our people. Let's continue. This was their little logo here. This is what they wanted. Mexico and a united South so that they could uh, have a, in their opinion, a more perfect union of slavery and benefiting off the backs of our people. So we see here a circle, which in and of itself, the way this is uh, situated is pagan. You see the crossbone and skull there in their image to the left. Okay. And so we're going to read a little bit more about it here. All right, so the Knights of the Golden Circle was a pro-slavery secret society founded in the decade before the American Civil War. During this time, the pro-slavery South and the anti-slavery North wanted to expand their borders and create new states aligned with their respective causes. George Bickley founded the Knights of the Golden Circle intending to create a pro-slavery empire to ensuring, excuse me, and ensure slavery lasted indefinitely. While the underground organization would fall short of this goal, they were still influential. At their highest point, Bickley claimed the Knights membership numbered over 100,000, 100,000 members. It was probably closer to 50,000, he says, it says, but it included many prominent politicians. Many Knights of the Golden Circle would fight for the Confederacy during the Civil War. While the group would ultimately dissolve, their ideals lived on for decades afterward and really still live today. Okay, for most of its history, the United States has pursued a policy of expansionism dubbed the Manifest um, Destiny. In 1845, the philosophy of this policy was that America should always expand its boundaries to spread democracy and capitalism worldwide. That's what they tell us. In the decades after the country's founding, the northern and southern states developed on different paths. While the northern American states weren't entirely anti-slavery, their economy wasn't based on slave labor. In the south, slavery was the entire foundation of their economy, and they did not want to lose that. So they wanted to create an environment and a world where they would have their free slave labor forever. 
And this is the man right there on the screen. George Bickley was born sometime between 1819 and 1823, and accounts of his early life come primarily from Bickley himself, which are often contradictory and unverifiable. <laughs> Let's talk about the Knights of the Golden Circle. By 1854, George Bickley was on the run from creditors and ended up in Tennessee. According to Bickley, on July 4th, 1854, he and five other men founded the Knights of the Golden Circle as a secret society, and it had bylaws, rituals. I wonder what those rituals were. I wonder if those rituals had anything to do with harming our people in any way. Just a question. And a constitution. Members fell into three categories. A military wing that planned to participate in conquest, a financial wing who would support the group from home, and a governing wing. They based themselves on pre-existing organizations like the Order of the Lone Star, a Texas group that opposed government intervention in the slaveholding South. Their goal was no less than to build a slaveholding empire. The KGC hoped to sponsor military expedition expeditions to annex territory in the American Southwest, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. With a capital in Havana, Cuba, this 2,400 square mile empire would dominate the world's sugar and tobacco trades and guarantee slavery survival. Bickley traveled to the, to the country to drum up membership. Pro-slavery Southern newspapers amplified his message and the movement grew. Bickley claimed to boast a membership of 115,000. KCG members still included pro-slavery politicians like Secretary of, Secretary of War John Floyd, Secretary of the Treasury Howell Cobb, and Vice President John Breckinridge. As the nation, nation approached civil war, anti-slavery Republicans accused KCG members of secretly supporting the Southern cause, and I'm sure they did. Okay, so this article goes on to talk about how the desire was to invade Cuba and take over the territory and form their what they would consider a more perfect union of perpetual slavery. Okay, so why is this significant? Well, here's an image right now on the screen once again of the region that they wanted to co-opt and turn into their their Beulah land for themselves for free labor. Okay, so but why is this significant? This is significant because part of the region where they were headquartered was in Carbondale. Yes, family, Carbondale. Carbondale, Illinois. You think the father, you think the father sending us a sign? Carbondale, Illinois was one of the headquarters of this movement. Hallelujah. The Most High Yahuwah is strategic, he is brilliant, and he is not playing. He's letting people know, I see you, and I see what you've done. And rather than allow them to gain any success in what they're planning, he brought on the Civil War. And the Civil War ended any plans, any hope that they were going to be able to be successful in their plans to create perpetual slavery for his people. Hallelujah. So it's really interesting that that is where this um, this X was. And also, once again, this area is called Little Egypt, right? <laughs> it's called Little Egypt. So the father's speaking. And it's no coincidence that both, both eclipses are going to cross over that region. But there's another reason why this is significant. So let's talk about it. We're going to talk now about the New Madrid Fault Zone. I know we're talking about a lot of different things, so I pray that you are holding with me. Uh, you know what? It is not surprising to me to know that Carbondale was a sundown town. That does not surprise me at all. I figured it would. I checked the statistics, and I believe right now it's almost 90% um, Caucasian in, in Carbondale. So let's continue on then. Let's continue on. So let's talk now about the New Madrid Fault Zone, Okay. And already, some of you are probably already seeing the significance of it, but there we are. Okay, so there it is. It's a fault zone that runs through several states in the Midwest of the United States. Okay, and you see the dashed white line. It gives an indication of this fault zone. 
And the, the fault pretty much follows the path of the Mississippi River, okay? So you see the Mississippi is that squiggly black line. It pretty much runs along the Mississippi River, okay? The New Madrid fault zone was active in the 1800s and it produced, I believe, a 7.7 .7, um, magnitude earthquake that affected this region greatly. It, it had a great effect and it was sparsely populated at the time. If it was as populated as it is now, oh my gosh, the devastation would have been horrific. Okay, but there weren't a whole lot of people here in the early 1800s when this thing um, decided to, it began to become active. There was several series of earthquakes before it um, culminated in the 7.7 .7, uh, magnitude earthquake. Okay, but we're going to talk more about this. So here we see on the screen another map of the United States, and it's talking about the 1811 um, magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake that struck this area. And the, the focus or the locus of this earthquake, the epicenter of the earthquake was in Missouri, okay, in a town called New Madrid. That is why they call it the New Madrid quake, because the epicenter occurred in that region. Okay, and so as we look at these um, these images on the screen, we see the red area is described as extreme and violent shaking, shaking in the red. Excuse me, extreme in the in the red. In the, I guess the dark orange, we see violent shaking, and then severe in the lighter colored orange and then very strong in the light, light orange, and then strong in the yellow, moderate in the green. The moderate extends all the way to the coastlines family and all the way into Michigan and into Philadelphia. So this had a great effect back in, in you know, 1811, 1811, 1812, when these things were happening. You can see many earthquakes one 7.7 .7, um, in December, and then a little later that same day, there was a 7.0, and then in January the next year, they had a 7.5, and then in February, they had another 7.7, .7, okay? So all in the sevens range, this earthquake went off near, guess where? That the, the severe, just under severe, yeah, the severe range, encompasses the region of Carbondale. I wonder if that's a coincidence, but maybe not. So this region encompasses the area of Carbondale or Little Egypt. Okay, let's continue. So we see here another example on the screen of the seismic zones. We have the Wabash Valley seismic zone, the Numadric um, seismic zone, and then the East Tennessee seismic zone. And when one goes off, when you have a major earthquake, it can transfer energy to others. So you could have a massive conflagration within the seismic zones that are nearby one another when one is affected by a pretty major earthquake, okay? And please note where that is, family. Please note where these zones are as we continue. So once again, another map that shows uh, where the damage was. It was catastrophic once again in the, e in the region of Little Egypt and in the Midwest there. And then more severe as it, excuse me, less and less severe as it bubbles and extends outward. Okay, let's continue again.
Mosthai is giving us signs in the moons, in the sun, the stars, the moon, the sun, the stars, about what is coming upon the earth. And we know that Babylon will be judged. And when Babylon is judged, in similar fashion as Babylon has done to his people, so will it be done to Babylon, okay? Babylon enslaved his people. The people of Babylon are going to be enslaved. They were cruel and treated our people without any compassion, and so it will happen to them. The people that the Father will allow to come in and take over, they will be cruel and brutal, and they will show no compassion to the young or to the old. They parted up the Most High's land, and so will their land be parted up and carved up and divided up. But it will, all, but it will also be parted up, physically speaking, okay? And that is what one of the things that the Father was showing me, the significance of this eclipse or these eclipses and what they're saying to us about the things that are to come, okay? In this video, I'm going to be discussing with you two quakes, specifically in Madrid and the West Coast, which have been prophesied and even scientifically predicted to come. They're not far off, folks. I heard John Paul Jackson talking about that the Madrid would go first before the West Coast. I didn't remember where I'd heard that. Uh, I thought it was relevant, and, and it is relevant if you're looking for signs to come. I found, I stumbled across that video, I found where he said it. Earthquakes will begin to strike not only coastal areas, but even the Midwest will experience a devastating one. In fact, the Midwest may experience one before any coastal city does. I also found it fascinating, interesting, because I believe that video was done in 2008, if I'm correct. In that same video, he's mentioning the Ukraine. Russia is going to try to enhance this escalation of, of tensions by creating an oil crisis. They're going to end up taking or try to take control of the Ukraine, and they will continue to arm Iran with weapons to further ignite an oil crisis. This is my beautiful rendition of the Mississippi. Great Lakes, United States, Pacific, Gulf, Atlantic, okay? If you can believe... You know, I, I saw this, this strange headline. It said, The Great Divide, the new normal on the Mississippi River. And something, it's like this was a headline after an earthquake. So a little while after an earthquake had happened, and they were no longer able to go all the way up the Mississippi from New Orleans, all the way up the Mississippi. They weren't able to any longer. Somehow something happened with the river in an, in an earthquake. And so they call it the Great Divide and how business was now operating on the Mississippi River since they could not traverse the whole, the whole way up. They also said that the Mississippi River, which is basically the Madrid, John Kilpatrick had a had a, a, a dream. John, April 2008, yes. you had a dream. What did God show you? It was a very stirring dream. I never had one that real before. When I woke up, it stirred me to the point that I asked my wife to hold me, and I'm, you know, a grown man, and I've never done that ever before with a dream of any kind. But I dreamed of an earthquake that took place. It, it, showed, it was shown to me in several stages, and I won't go through the details of it, but. Um, uh, the Lord showed me that an earthquake was going to hit in the middle part of the country, right where the New Madrid Fault is. And it was so real that it, when the Lord showed it to me, that I'd walk by the television set for several days after that, and I, in my mind I couldn't understand why it wasn't on television. I, I, I can understand that. That's how real it was. It was going to become the Great Divide, okay? I'm also going to, during this, at some point during this video, I'm going to show you credible scientific drawings or at least people that believe they understand fault lines and what the United States will look like after the Madrid goes and after the West Coast goes. So what you see on the screen is something called the U.S. Navy map. Okay. I came across this map, gosh, 10, 15 years ago. When people were talking about Nibiru, I don't know if you have heard about Nibiru or Nibiru, they were talking about the pole shift and things that were coming to the earth that would cause the United States essentially to be split and divided. And that the New Madrid as well as the San Andreas 
uh, would cause major earthquakes. And the United States would look sort of similar to this, okay? If you look at this blue region, family, if you look at it, this is pretty much the path of this eclipse that's coming. It's a harbinger. It's letting us know that something's coming, okay? It's a harbinger. Let's continue on. When you look at the regions here and you see the areas in blue, these are the areas that is being predicted will be underwater. Actually, there's more, there's more on the East Coast that's not included in this map, but essentially areas of the United States will become like, like islands. It'll be divided up. So they parted and divided up the Most High's land, so their land will be divided up and parted. Okay. Once again, in this U.S. Navy map, it's indicating what's going to happen when these events that the Father has orchestrated begins to occur on the Earth. I believe that the damage on the West Coast will be much more significant than they're indicating they're near California. But the crux of the matter is, is that there's going to be a large swath of land that sinks under the sea. Okay. And as you can see where the Midwest is, they have water going all the way from Texas all the way up into Canada because this is the judgment that's coming where the New Madrid is once again going to produce a massive earthquake and it's going to split the nation. Not in half, mm -hmm. but in thirds. Water. Many of you have been having visions of tsunamis. I have. The father showed me a massive tsunami hitting the East Coast. Okay? When the land begins to shake, it produces tsunamis. And these things are coming. This is just part of the judgment for Babylon. Babylon's judgment will be great. Here's another map. Um, a future map of America uh, created by Gordon Michael Scallion. And as you can see, going through the Midwest, it's essentially an inland river going all the way through. And so the United States is divided up and carved up, okay? If you look at where the water the waterway is, where the Mississippi River used to be, that is essentially the path of this eclipse. Now, don't you tell me that that's a, a coincidence. I don't believe in that kind of coincidence. The Father is speaking, okay? Once again, a U.S. Navy map of the future where they're indicating the regions that will be turned into water, okay? There'll be water, an inland sea in the middle of the United States. The land will be parted, it will be carved up. And, and the Father is going to physically divide the land. Ezekiel chapter 9. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. And now the glory of Elua of Yasharal, the Elua of Yasharal, had gone up from the chair where it had been to the threshold. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And Yahuwah said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark. Put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said, in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. But do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Judgment always begins at the house of Yahuwah. And this judgment that's coming to the United States and to the other parts of the world, judgment begins upon the Most High's people first. And there's some of our people who aren't doing right. They're not where they need to be spiritually. Judgment begins at the house of the Most High first. 
So they began with the elders who were before the temple. And he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. Just then, the man clothed with linen, who had the inkhorn at his side, reported back and said, I have done as you commanded me. Okay. So when these judgment began in earnest, probably part of the first people who are going to be affected by these things are going to be those disobedient Hebrews who will not heed and they will not awaken. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of revelation, excuse me, the temple of heaven, from the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightning, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before Yahuwah to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So Babylon the Great was divided into three parts. Hallelujah. May the words of the Most High be true, and every man a liar. Hallelujah. So I think it's very interesting that this path of totality, this path of this upcoming solar eclipse, total solar eclipse, Follow, follows the path of this fault along the new Madrid fault line. I do believe it's a harbinger. I do believe it's a sign of the father's mark, Yahusha, being the Alaf Tau, telling us that those who are to be spared from the things to come must be marked themselves. We must have the mark, the Alaf Tau of Yahuwah in us, on us. That is the mark that the Father's looking for. The Aleph Tau of the Son in us. He's looking for that. And for those, he will protect. For those who do not have that mark, judgment. Hallelujah. So I pray that you all have gotten something from the lesson for today and that the Father has spoken to you through this message and the warnings that are contained within it. There are harbingers, there are signs in the heavens and in the earth. The Most High is letting us know that the time of his judgments are at hand and that we have a responsibility to make sure that we get into the ark of safety and that we are marked with the mark that he has told us that we need, his mark, the mark of Alaf Tau, which can only be given to us through his son. We can't go to heaven and ask the Father to mark us himself. The only way that he has provided for that is through his son, Yahusha. So if you aren't marked, the wrath of Yahuwah abides on you. How do you know if you're marked? How do you live? Are you a rebel? Are you obedient? Are you humble? Are you producing fruits unto righteousness? Do you love to seek after the Most High? Do you love to read your word? Do you love to pray? Do you love to worship? If you don't love these things, it's a sign that the love of the Father may not be in you. So we've got to check ourselves daily because the time is hastening fast for these things that are being prescribed, that are being described in the scriptures to come to pass. May the Most High Yahuwah Baruch and keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom and shalom, peace in every area. And I pronounce this barakah on those who are seeking the Most High Yahuwah. For if you are not seeking the Most High Yahuwah, the barakah, it won't land. So we all must be about our Father's business and seeking to enter into that ark before the storms begin. Now, am I saying in this video that something is going to happen during the eclipse? No, I'm not. I'm calling it a harbinger. I'm calling it a sign. We know that things are coming. We know the judgments are coming. We don't know when, but the Father's giving us sign after sign after sign. The Francis got 
key bridge accident was a sign. The Father is speaking to us, and we need to heed, we need to hear, and we need to make seeking Him the most important thing that we do in our day. Shalom, shalom.